welcome to Teach the Word. Uh, thank you for joining today. We're going to talk about the what it means to follow Jesus and the costs of following Jesus from his own words, what he said about the cost of following him. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we love you, Lord. We want to be your followers, and we ask for your help in following you. Help us, Father God, to be your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in the Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's a parallel passage which is basically um, where Jesus is saying what the cost of discipleship is, the cost of following him. And let's start with that passage. Um, in <clears throat> Matthew, it's Matthew 16, starting in verse 24. So why don't we turn there? Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And if you wanted, you could put your finger in Mark 8 and Luke 9. So, but that's where, where we're going to start is Matthew 16, 24. Parallel passages, Mark 8 and Luke 9. So, let us begin. Verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, that there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. That's Matthew 16, 24 through 28. We'll read each of the parallel passages before we begin to discuss this, because they're very similar in content. So now it's Mark 8, 34 through 38. When he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So that's Mark 8. Uh, end of the chapter, 34 through 38. Now we go to Luke 9, 23 through 26. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory, and in his Father's, and of the holy angels. But I tell you the truth, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. So that's the four passages. Uh, once again, it's Mark 16, I mean Matthew 16, 24 through 28, Mark 8, 34 through 38, and Luke 9, 23 through 26. It's all the same content. They're really what we see is kind of what I'd say four uh, points, let's say, or, or aspects of the cost of following Jesus. Um, so in each of these passages, the first is self-denial. In order to, file, to be followers of Jesus, we must be deniers of ourself. So uh, self-pleasing and uh, self-gratification does not come part and parcel with following Jesus. Following Jesus is a life of Denying one's self. Uh, that's how each of these passages start. Uh, <clears throat> the second is cross bearing. Let him take up his cross. Um, cross bearing is is uh, putting yourself to death in a sense, walking to one's execution. Uh, something that Paul picks up a lot in the epistles about putting to death our our fleshly body. In other words, the desires for sin. And the, desire, and the desires to self-gratify. So it's very similar to uh, self-denial, but there's an aspect here of uh, 
willing to follow Jesus even in the face of death or to the point of the cost being death. If it's going to cost me my life, will I continue to follow Jesus? And, and in order to be a follower of Jesus, it's required to, to be a cross bearer, someone who will follow Christ to the point of death in the face of death. Um, in particular, Luke added something different than Matthew and Mark in the taking up the cross. Luke said daily, let him take up his cross daily. So in other words, daily uh, being willing to follow Jesus to the point of death or daily following him to the point of death. So we got uh, self-denial is the first aspect here. The second that's common in all these passages is cross-bearing. And then the third is actually following. Deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Um, Probably when Jesus spoke those words, it meant literally follow him around Galilee, Judea, all in his earthly traveling, being part of the people who traveled with him, following him. Um, uh, now it means basically following in his footsteps, doing the kinds of works that Jesus did, being about his business, advancing uh what he was advancing while he was here on earth, as opposed to being about the business of some other enter entity or enterprise or ourselves. It's being uh, ambassadors for the kingdom of God, followers of Christ. And then uh, the last part kind of comes at the end is about shame. Do not, uh, not being ashamed of him uh, is a requirement of following him. In order to be a follower of Jesus, I cannot be ashamed of him or his message, what he said, what he preached, even the controversial things, even the things that my culture may push back against. If I am uh, ashamed of him, I'm not a follower. Being unashamed of his message is a requirement for being a follower. And if I am <clears throat> ashamed, he will be ashamed of me before his father's face and coming kingdom. That's that's the message in a nutshell of the cost of discipleship passages or teaching of Jesus in the synoptic gospels. Um, though it's not the only thing that Jesus has to say about following him, but it's the most, uh, let's say, the most comprehensive uh, teaching on it. Uh, other passages that are about this. Um, Matthew 10. Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Very uh, much talks about a cost that the followers of Jesus will pay in uh, their personal relationships. So 10, 34 through 39. Do not think, this is Matthew 10, 34. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's servants will be, or a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. You see there the, the similar theme to uh, of the cross bearing. It's basically, if I... Uh, try to hang on to my life, I, you know, gain the whole world, gain my life, I lose out on real life, you know, the eternal life, the abundant life, I lose out on, you know, I lose my soul, so to speak. So it's, it's a trade in following Jesus. I'm trading my own life for his cross to gain real life, is the idea of these passages. And there's cost, there's real cost. There's a cost of relational strife. You see that really clearly. Uh, the strife that falls, conflict between all, all the intimate relationships in one's life. It's a result of following uh, Jesus because um, only those who are also following Jesus can, uh, can accept my following Jesus. And those who are not following Jesus, in a sense, are opposed to me following Jesus automatically. Not that they purpose to be opposed to, but they're just, their agenda intersects with mine in an opposing way. 
is the idea of Jesus' teaching. Um, there's a much stronger statement of this passage uh, in, a, in Luke. The, the parallel for Matthew 10 is Luke 12. If we go there to Luke 12, you'll see what I mean when I say much stronger statement. Um, verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided against three, two against... Oh, five in one house will be divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son. Son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So in other words, you're, there's no neutrality. You're forced into a decision, basically. Jesus forces a decision. You either follow me or you don't follow me. You have to make the decision. And, and there's a it's the dividing line, the, the message that Jesus came to preach. And, it, and it's, that's a strong statement about I've come to bring strife, not peace. It's pretty uh, pretty strong. If you look just a few chapters further on in Luke, we have uh, Luke 25, uh, Luke 14, 25. You have the uh, uh, same, very similar sentiments. Uh, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and he said to them, you get the idea that he's, he, he may be trying to, weed out the multitudes, thin them down. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while he is yet still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So he's urging this, this mass of multitude, right, from verse 25, to think it through. There's a real cost to following Jesus. He's saying, there's a real cost to following me, guys. You have to you have to forsake all that you have. And he goes so far as to state it as um, hating one's father and mother, brothers and sisters. That level of forsaking all. Um, this, I, I, I think this is hyperbole, you know, overstatement. He doesn't mean literally to hate them, he means to, uh, in comparison to Jesus, it's like hate for how much they love Jesus, their devotion to Jesus, by contrast. But um, <clears throat> the cost aspect is, there's two analogies, right? A war and a building project, planning ahead. Can I do this? Do I have, a, do I have the means to do it? Can I actually follow Jesus? Am I actually going to take up my cross? Am I actually going to be able to deny myself? He's saying, don't do it. Think it through. He's actually kind of talk people out of following him, which is kind of remarkable uh, in one sense. He's not, he's not trying to gain a huge crowd. Um, he's trying to windle it down, weed it, weed out the, weed it down. We see the same thing in the uh, <coughs> same kind of weeding down process in uh, John 6. Let's go over to John. We've been in the Synoptic Gospels. Um, here he doesn't tell them that he need to hate their father and mother like he did in Luke, or Luke uh, 14, 26, what we just read. But he tells them something that's pretty much Im unpalatable, unable to be received, unable to be heard. It may not seem... We may not sense the strongness of how repulsive what he says is coming out of our culture, but we can 
<clears throat> we can reference some Jewish law to see how unpalatable it is for them. So we're starting John 6. Let's start in verse 48. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which came, comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said to the synagogue as he taught. In the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So you get the idea. It's, he's, he's saying you have to be, be cannibalistic. You have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they can't handle it. In fact, uh, it says at the, towards the end here that uh, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Uh, and then, uh, where is it? Verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. They, they stopped following him. Because they think the cost is too great. Um, <clears throat> we can't do this. Um, then he turns to, when that happens, he turns to his disciples, the 12 disciples whom he chose specifically, and he says, uh, verse 67, Do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter's response is, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So this is, this is like a lot here, right? You know, what is going on? Uh, well, one thing that I, I think kind of obvious that I wanted to point out is that Jesus is trying to get people to not follow him. He's trying to, talk, in a sense, talk people out because there's a real, following Jesus is tough and it's hard. And it's like uh, a lot of people have jumped on, like jumping on the bandwagon, and he knows they haven't really thought it through. They don't really get it. And he's trying to make it, make them really get it. And in so doing, he is, uh, he's really, uh, in a sense, being enigmatic. You know, hate your father and mother, uh, drink, eat my blood, drink my flesh. Um, I just want to point out how, how externally repulsive, I mean, cannibalism is repulsive to anyone, but the meat with blood in it is extra repulsive to Jews because both in the Noahic covenant in Genesis 9, verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. No, not verse 6. Where am I? Verse 4. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. He doesn't. He, he, he's giving them a diet, diet uh, prescription in this passage, the Noahic Covenant, and he's telling them they can eat animals. Prior to the Noahic Covenant, they were only supposed to eat plants. And he's saying, but don't eat any flesh with the blood in it. Don't drain the blood out. And then in the, the Mosaic Law, so the Mosaic, Sinai Covenant on Sinai, this is this is the covenant with, with made with Moses, mediated by Moses, not the one with Noah. In Genesis nine. This is Genesis nine is specific is general to all of humanity. Uh, Mosaic covenant is specific to the nation of Israel. So we're in Leviticus seven. I was going to read Leviticus seven twenty six. Some background here. Um, Moreover, you shall not eat any blood in any of your dwellings, whether a bird or beast. Whoever eats any blood, that person shall be cut off from his people. So blood is, <clears throat> we may not think of as Gentiles, and Gentile civilization and culture, the blood is a bad thing to be 
consuming as, as much, as strongly as the Jews would have. But I mean, everyone, I think, thinks of cannibalism as not, not okay. It seems to be <clears throat> almost universal. I mean, we have heard about cannibalistic societies, right? Most cultures, it's, it's, a, it's not an okay idea. So what is Jesus doing here? So that's a, that's a, big, uh, a big question mark. And one of the things that I think he's doing in this passage is um, he's kind of throwing in their face this. He's pointing something out to them. Um, he's kind of pointing out their, their inability to um, look at the Mosaic law Moses and the prophets, and see that he's a fulfillment of it. Uh, so he's he's kind of doing like a double whammy. You can't you can't rightly interpret Moses, and you also can't even rightly interpret my words because he's giving them hard sayings that on the surface appear one way, and they they reject him because of how those words appear. And he's he's kind of like. I think prodding or poking at the idea that he is being rejected by the Jewish people because they don't rightly understand the, the words of Moses and the prophets. The words of Moses and the prophets speak and testify towards Jesus, and they're rejecting Jesus because they don't actually rightly understand the words of the prophets. So Jesus is kind of like saying, well, you don't understand the prophets. That's why you don't accept me, and you don't even understand my words. That's why you don't accept me. Um, <clears throat> That's how, that's one way in which I look at this passage. So what is, what is Jesus actually saying in this passage? I, I think he's talking about, uh, <clears throat> in a sense, feeding on him in the sense that he is the, the word, he's the logo. So if you look at the beginning of the book, um, so John 1, so six chapters earlier, you'll see, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him was not made anything that was made. In him was life. That life was the light of man. Light shines in the darkness. And you jump all the way down to, uh, what is it? Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus becoming man is this, the word of God becoming flesh. The idea is to take in the word of God into our hearts and our minds. Jesus is the word in flesh. Eat flesh, drink my blood. There's also a reference here to the act of communion, which is a uh, ordinance or a sacrament of the Christian church. One of the reasons why the Christian church was accused uh, by Roman authorities as uh, of cannibalism early on because of this, doctor, this practice of the sacrament of communion where they would uh, take bread and wine, they would bless it uh, and eat it in remembrance of the death of Jesus as a sacrifice for their sins. That's another thing that is being brought up here is is uh, the sacrificial lamb aspect of Jesus. That when you when you took a sacrifice to the to the temple, you killed it and you poured out its blood uh, on the ground. You sprinkled the blood into a pan. You slit the throat. Blood went into a pan. You know, you sprinkle that around the altar, put it sometimes on your big toe oh, and your thumb and your right ear. Uh, you never ate the blood or drank the blood. You ate the meat. So eating Jesus is, is acknowledging that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. So there's a, there's a lot of depth, okay, to this idea of Jesus is speaking in very much a poetic way, um, which I think, I think is another uh, basically you know, requirement for following Jesus is this sense to have the ability to have a poetic capacity to, to hear his vo voice and, and interpret his words, both to hear and understand. Um, if you flip maybe from John 6, if we go over to like John 10, you get, uh, you get a little thing about uh, an analogy or an illustration. Uh, so let's read 1 through 6, say, John 10. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the sheep, shep, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. 
Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Uh, you get the idea of that, see, this, this lack of ability to understand. So he's speaking somewhat enigmatically, right? And there's a, in order to be able to follow Jesus, you have to have this, this capacity that's really not yours. It's in a sense given by God, but to understand what, the, what, what he's talking about when he's speaking enigmatically. And, and then also just to be able to hear his voice. So, you know, discerning the promptings of the Holy Spirit um, in your life, there's nothing clear and straightforward about it. Um, it's very much like poetry. Um, inferences kind of have to be made. Um, you feel God's putting his finger on something in your life that he wants to change. You, you know, it may not be something that's explicitly sin, like, you know, you know, there's nothing wrong with, say, watching a football game, but maybe you're feeling, because the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is calling to you in a sense, that, you know, I want to spend the time with you on Sunday afternoon. I want you to be alone with me. I should be in prayer. I don't want you watching the football game. There's no, you couldn't, you know, read scripture and decide, oh, okay, I shouldn't watch football because on uh, Sunday afternoon, because that's, uh, that's a, that, you know, that's condemned in scripture. It's explicitly a sin. Now, you never get that that way. But <clears throat> the Holy Spirit may, may put a little tug on your heart on per, for perfectly normal activities. You know, it doesn't have to be enough to pick on football. You could, you could pick on, you know, I don't know, <clears throat> watching Netflix or uh, going shopping or whatever it is that, um, Maybe he wants you, he wants time with you in prayer. Uh, or maybe he wants you to, to, to go and, and, and uh, minister somehow in some way. He's putting it on your heart to, uh, you know, go, you know, message somebody and see how they're doing or uh, check up on someone or help someone out with some project that they're working on. Now, these are, these are the, the almost imperceptible nudgings. In, in the thought life of, of the Holy Spirit on the believer. Um, and if we're going to follow Jesus, you know, follow his promptings, there's this capacity that's required to sort of hear and, and discern what is not clear, what is very much so maybe enigmatic. And so <clears throat> that's an aspect of following Jesus. Um, and I, I, I'll call it uh, poetic capacity, kind of the ability to, to kind of dance around with... Uh, with me, with discern meaning, poetic capacity, with, with unclear directions, unclear instructions, but to follow, regardless. Um, or maybe Jesus is highlighting that when he says stuff like, you got to hate your father and mother to follow me, or in order to follow me, you got to drink your uh, drink my blood and eat my flesh. Maybe he's, he's in, in, in one sense, one aspect of that communication is to communicate, well, that in order to follow me, you got to have some kind of uh, poetic ability to, to discern, hear me and discern what I'm saying. And I think that in, in our life today, with our walk with the Holy Spirit, that's required to um, to respond to the Holy Spirit's nudgings. Um, so anyways, just a little bit about following Jesus from his own uh, words in the Gospels. Uh, thank you for joining. Let's just close with prayer for our, our ability to follow. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be your people, your servants. We ask for your power, your help to love you with all our hearts, all our souls, all our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a good one. Thank you.